Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hello, Gwyneth. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm fine. Thank you for inviting me onto the show. I hope everything's all right with you today. I'm absolutely fine, thank you. And uh, it's a beautiful sunny day, uh, temperature a bit warmer. <laughs> so hopefully... Not sunny here. Isn't it? No. Oh, well, maybe we're going to get the cloud here as well, but it's, yeah. I mean, the strangest thing was like, I mean, anybody listening to this podcast, we're in the UK where the weather is very weird. Like yesterday. <laughs> Always. Yeah, yesterday, I think we had a frost. It was like two degrees when I went to walk the dog. And then this morning, or even last night, it was like 15 degrees. So like a 17 degree swing, Celsius that is, in a day. <laughs> um, it's like, what's going on with the weather again? You Absolutely. Know? And it's not as if we're very far apart, is it? So, no. And yet the difference between just a few miles down the road can be tremendous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So... Um, Again, welcome to the podcast, and I'm really looking forward to hearing your story. We've met a couple of times, we've done some Zoom yeah. meetings, so we know a little bit about each other, but I, I still would like to hear the full story this time. Just how long have you got, Michael? Oh, as long <laughs> as you need, as long as you need. So, the, the, I ask everybody the same question, and the opening question, which gets everything started, and that is... Gwyneth, tell us a little bit about yourself, about your personal life to begin with. Where were you born? Have you moved around? A bit about your education, your family, as much as you'd like to share. You don't have to share personal stuff that much, but we want to get a sense of where it all started and then eventually we'll get to current day. Over to you. Eventually. It's been a bit <laughs> of a it's been a bit of a journey. Um Great. First of all, I was born in the southeast England. If the people listening are from the UK, they will know that if I say, if you look under the table, you'll see the white stilettos. That I mean, I'm an Essex girl. Oh. Um, however, my parents immediately almost moved up to Scotland. So despite the fact you can't hear it now, when I learned to speak, I had a wonderful Scottish accent. Wow. Then we moved back down to, to Essex again, and that's really where I was brought up. Until I was 16, uh, I lived in Essex, went to a girls' grammar school, a very, very traditional UK life. Um, I will say UK, British. I'm not going to say English, because my father was Welsh, and that is very, very important to me. Yes. Um, and when I was 16, we moved to North Wales, uh, changed school, went to a very different kind of school. It had been girls' grammar down in the south. I went to a mixed comprehensive, mm. and I completely fluffed my A-levels. Um, right. <laughs> yes. That school change was a really bad thing, I thought of at course. the time. Yeah. Um, but even so, I struggled into university. Now, the thing about my A-levels was um, really... I didn't know whether I wanted to do arts or sciences. The right. only piece of careers advice I'd got when I was back in Essex was, you'll get a better social life if you do sciences. Because really? back in the day, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, um, because women, there were not so many women in science. Right. And so it was going to be more fun at university if I did sciences. Ah, right, right. And much as I would have liked to have done Latin, Greek, ancient history. That wasn't available when I moved to North Wales. I ended up doing maths, maths and physics. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why I fluffed them. <clears throat> I ended up at Nottingham reading maths and economics. And yeah, I'm not sure that was where I should have been going, mm -hmm. but that's where I got to. Um, I went back when I got my degree, which actually was in economics because the maths, mm, the maths teacher, the maths professor did actually say, no, don't go on with the maths after the right. first year's results. 
<laughs> so um, I went back to North Wales and got a job in the Welsh Development Agency. So um, theoretically something to do with my economics, but it was very much an admin job. Mm. Threw it all in and went off to Zambia for a month uh, because of a guy I'd met in the last term at university. Right. And came back to be unemployed. And right. unemployed in North Wales back in that time was not necessarily the best position to be in, but they were desperate to get people off their books. And so when I got offered a job in London, I think they paid the first, I don't know if it was week or month, to give you something to live on in the meantime. That was the days when there were facilities for things like that. There was money to pay people to move and get jobs. So I moved up to London and became a programmer analyst. Wow. And that was, <laughs> yes, um, it was but interesting, did, yeah. <laughs> did you have any, any experience of that before? None, none whatsoever. No. At the end of that first year at university, we were offered a course in computing. And my oh. boyfriend at the time said to me, why would you do that? You're never going to use a computer. Oh, never. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and I didn't do the course so right. as I say this is back in the day when you didn't have to have studied to get the job you didn't have I mean yes we vocational courses if you were doing something like medicine mm. you needed a degree in me medicine yeah. yeah but for most jobs well for a start there weren't that many computing courses available mm. so it didn't matter you went to university to prove that you could study to prove that you were capable of something yes and the experience that you got there was as much life experience living away from home yeah being on your own it was i don't know it was sort of a, a step towards then going out and getting a job gotcha. and so yeah i ended up in london um was working actually on fault reporting on the national grid mm -hmm. um which was very, very different back then from what it is now. Mm. Uh, and then I threw that job in and moved out to California uh, with another guy. Uh, not the one that I'd gone to Zambia with. <laughs> <laughs> and then ended up actually, I got married before we went out to California the second time. But uh -huh. marriage was not actually really what I'd wanted, so... He stayed in California. I came back to Britain. Um, what did I do then? So how long oh, were you I, in America for? Um, about three years in total. Okay. Well, on two different occasions. Well, that's quite a long time in terms of getting a sense of the world, isn't it? I mean, Definitely. you didn't say how long you were in Zambia for. Was that just... Oh, a, that, was only, that was only a month. Okay. That was, um, that was just something I think I needed to get out of my system. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't, it, though it did make a difference, um, did make a difference to who I am and I'm, I'm sure it did. Of course. But no, California was much more formative, although that was there. I, I was there on a, what I would call a bags and baggage visa. Uh, even when I went out, when I was married, I couldn't work. I couldn't, oh, right. I couldn't find a job. So I did right. some voluntary work right. um, with one of the organisations that teaches English to immigrants. Right. And I really enjoyed doing that. So yeah. when I came back to the UK and at that stage, I was really up for reinventing myself again. First of all, I'd gone back to the job that I'd had before I'd left. The programmer um, job. Well, this was actually a bit later and I was teaching um, teaching computing, but with the early desktop computers, the early PCs. Right. And it was an organisation that taught both in organis organisations in different businesses or brought in mixed groups and they all had their PC on their desk. And this was all very, very modern. Um, and I loved that job. I loved teaching. But... I wasn't particularly happy when I came back in the, the office that I'd moved to, which was their Birmingham office. Right. 
and they offered me I could go back up to London I could go up to Scotland for a while where they'd got another office and it was very very tempting and then I went if I stayed here I am so going to be in the rat race and I'm not going to be brave enough to leave right so I went no this is time to reinvent myself and that's precisely what I did I left the job went and got a qualification in teaching English as a foreign language and moved to Spain. <laughs> this, is a, this is a period of I'm discovering who I am and what <laughs> I want to me, do in life. <laughs> it took me a very long time. Indeed, isn't that what life is? Discovering oh, who you are the whole life? Yeah, 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 yeah. It never ends. It never ends. I do agree, yeah. <laughs> But that yeah. was quite, I mean, and interestingly enough, there's, there's like foreign elements involved abroad as well. So Absolutely, which is yeah. very strange because um, both my brother and sister had studied, at least they'd studied French to A-level. I'd studied French O-level, which was pretty much compulsory when I did O-levels. Mm. I'd got English, um, I'd got Latin O-level but I didn't have any other modern language. Mm. Um, and yet I'm the one who clearly suffered with wanderlust. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, so, so yes, Spain. Spain. But, so interesting, did you have somewhere to live? Did you have a job? What, what, um, or was it another I, guy? <laughs> <laughs> now that, <laughs> actually, no, it wasn't. This no. time it was me. <laughs> right, right, okay. But um, it was good question. Good mm. question there. Um, no, what happened was I was travelling up from Solihull to Birmingham on the train, reading a newspaper. Um, this was to the computer teaching job, and I opened the newspaper and it said, "Graduates teach English in Madrid," and I went, "I could do that." Mm. And I thought, I'm not happy where I am. I'll go for that interview. And I went for the interview, and I'm very glad I didn't get it. Mm. Um, but it had set the seed going. And so I went down to Bournemouth that summer, and I got the qualification to teach English as a foreign language. And I did manage to get a job in Madrid before I left the UK. They, the, the language schools would send people over to interview lots of different people in the UK. So I went out there, and this was long before um, 1990, not long before 1992, but before 1992 when Spain joined the European Union or Common Market or whatever we were calling it back then. Mm. Um, so I had to go through all the visa regulations and everything, and I only had a nine-month permit to go to Spain. And then they kicked you out for three months at least. But that was fine because it meant you could go back the next year and do another nine months academic year. And that's what I did. Um, and I'm not quite sure how long it was that I did that from one, uh, one language school to the next. But it, things changed before this. But at the end of the day, I was out in Spain for 25 years. Wow. Um, but that was not all teaching English. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. I met a guy. So my life changed again. Brilliant. Um, yeah, no, actually, I met my, my life partner and my business partner um, in Spain, yeah. in, in Madrid. And that's over there, we set up Tantamount. And right. Tantamount was now originally, that's the company that is now in England, that I'm fronting now in England. Um, but we originally set up in Spain. And it's, um, we were drawing on our own two specific skill sets. He's very much in um, publishing, back when publishing was all about um, cut and paste with a proper blade and glow, straight edges. Um, and my background, technical background, and also language teaching. And this sort of merged just as the the web became the web right and so we'd got real design we'd got some technical capability 
And essentially, we set up pretty much in the golden age of multimedia. We were, or we were already there, and we were ready for the golden age of multimedia when every book brought its own CD-ROM, when they were doing things like animated picto dictionaries. And it was an exciting time to be in tech. Right, right. Um, but I'm not really as techy as I my my background might suggest so mm. i moved more into the language side of things and yeah. by this stage i'd become pretty much fluent in spanish i was writing writing something i'd actually started back in california and i realized that it was something that mattered to me um so when you say writing were you writing a book or a novel or a i think the one genre that I have never really taken to is long form fiction. So right, right. definitely not a novel. No. Um, nonfiction, creative fiction, uh, poetry. Poetry is my love. Uh, okay. That's what I do. Right. Um, but yes, really anything in the way of words. And that, I suppose is at the heart of Tantamount, that we've got on the one side, we've got the design, the, the imagery, the artistic side of things. And on my side, quite firmly at the heart of the company, we've got the, the words mm. and it's this equivalence. Um, so yes, my, my own side of things is, is creative, um, but it's very much a language creation. Yeah, I'm okay. not sure where, I, where we go no, from no, there. The writing, I, my question was about the writing. You said you'd started writing something you'd started in California. Ah, oh, right. Back in California, I did some writing for other expats who were shipped out because my husband worked for what was then Burroughs Machines. And I, I found the the culture shock of moving to a different country, particularly a different country where you thought you understood what was going on because they speak the same language. Oh, Only, yeah. of course, they don't speak the same language. And so there are a lot of things of how to adapt. And, and I put, started putting these into little manuals that yes. were distributed, not in any way officially, but it distributed between the expats. Right. And I got such a kick out of that. I realized that I could write things that would be helpful to other people. Right. Explanatory and sort of, I think this is probably where I first started being what I would say an intermediary, an intermediary between cultures there. Mm -hmm. um, in Spain, there was a lot of working with clients who needed help Although their English was good, yeah. they needed help talking to their English speaking clients. Yeah. Um, and sometimes there are subtleties that you can't get across. If you mm. need to write an email to a client and tell them that really you're not very happy with them, but you've yes. got to do it professionally and you've got to be polite. And so those were the sort of emails I loved writing on behalf of our clients because you could just have a, a, a real subtle dig at people yes, yes. <laughs> and, and be paid for it, <laughs> uh, which is always nice. Yes. Um, so yeah, that's really the business side of writing. Since then I've written books as well, but right. the, the pleasure side of writing, the creative side was very much um, poetry. I've been writing a blog now for, oh, I don't know whether it's about, 15 years something like that um but it, that's where, just where does the blog live so our listeners can go and have a look right that's don't confuse the narrator.com and don't confuse the narrator because a lot of my writing is in first person and i found a lot of people i was very active in some of the writers groups in madrid and they assumed that if you write in first person that means it's you and some of the experiences just weren't me. They were me imagining being someone else. And that's one of the things I like about writing is you can put on different personas. 
Yes. You can try out different personas and find out what would happen if you felt like that, if you thought like that. Mm. Um, and so it was don't confuse the writer with the narrator. Right. That, so it's don't confuse the narrator is the name of the, the site. But very clever, please. very subtle that. Yeah, I always prefer the first person than the third person. I've always done so. I mean, I, that's the one thing. I'll have a quick look at your... Um, I'm looking at oh, LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Oh, you'll see that I do try and play down some of this creative side of things. Uh, it's no, no, not I'm talking about the first or third person. Yeah. So what yes. people do on LinkedIn, they write in the third person as oh, if yes. someone has written about them. When your profile on LinkedIn is very, you has to be you. So you need to be speaking to people when they're reading your profile. Um, it's just my, my, um, I yeah. used to do LinkedIn training. I do ago. agree with that. Um, and of course, if you're writing for a company website or something, it's also got to be more about you. It's got to be more about the client than it yeah. is about, yeah, yeah. and I can't remember who it was who said, stop weeing all over your website. Um, <laughs> it should be ewing, not weeing. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's not an original thought. No, that's fine. Well, you can make it original because I've never heard of it. <laughs> I, got, I like that. Okay. So, okay. So, so your love for writing is clearly there. And I think, you know, words, um, you know, or language today is actually, without a doubt, the most important thing. All you need to look at is how language is being used. Uh, it's not a great topic, but it's a really good example. If we talk about America just for a bit, so we take it out of yeah. this country and we look at what, you know, Donald Trump does over there. And he uses language very cleverly to his own benefit, of course. And he's, yes. he's invented a narrative and language that people have made as part of, um, you know, human yeah, dialogue now. It's, it's absolutely, of... he's taken ownership of a few phrases. And do you remember Humpty Dumpty in Through the Looking Glass? Words yeah, mean bit. what I, yeah, words mean what I want them to mean. Mm. And I think that if you're in a position of power like Trump is, you can sometimes take a word and use it or a word or a phrase and use it again and again yeah. and you take ownership of it and people stop processing it because we don't process language word by word we don't look at what each of them means we we take chunks of language mm. and and we react to them instinctively and if we've heard them in a particular context often enough mm. that's what we assume it means and we don't bother we're very lazy with how we process language and that's the only way we can communicate yes. it's not perhaps lazy isn't the best word it's the way that language is is coped with yes. otherwise you just get too much information yes. and you can't deal with it if you have to go back to square one every time you get a sentence you say what does this mean what does that mean mm. you haven't got time to do that um but yes, your language does shape your world. There's no doubt yeah. to that. 100%. And um, of course, I mean, you, you've been teaching people how to speak English uh, several times in your career, <laughs> but you are still teaching people today how to speak English, aren't you, effectively? I try to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It is, um, yeah, it's true that every, every business needs to communicate in a different way. Mm. They need different tones of voice. Um, and that isn't always apparent to, to the clients. Mm. And I don't know, sometimes we've also got the thing with written language needs to be more formal, when in fact, that isn't necessarily true. You... Yeah. 
because Tempermel is very much in the brand space and brand is all about personality and emotion. Mm. Now, the people who are listening to this will not have seen me, but they will have learned a lot about me by the way I talk, by the words that I'm using, by the tone of voice. And they'll know you, Michael, because they listen to the podcast regularly and they'll recognize you probably use the same phrase occasionally. You've got little verbal tics. These are all part of expressing you and your personality and your brand. Yeah. And that's what a business needs to do as well. Yeah. And it becomes it becomes fundamental to the mm. business mm. that the personality is put across. And mm. one, of the, one of the ways of doing that is through language. Yeah. So going back to the, we mustn't write contractions in formal, in written language so that mm. you've got to say, you are, we cannot. And that's not the tone of voice that most people would use. And you need mm. to speak to your clients, not write to them even if the medium is the written word. Mm, mm. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so we've we've kind of we went. I'm just going back a little bit on the journey. We went to Spain, and Tantamount was born. Absolutely, yes. It was Over set there. up in Spain, and that's where we started. And we were there for um, nearly. I suppose I said I was in Spain for 25 years. Mm. I think that Tantamount was in business in Spain for about 20 years. Right. Um, before we actually created the, the, the company, mm. we were using the name and then we created the company formally. Okay. And then because of the, uh, um, I'm preempting what I expect is the next question is why did I come back to the UK? <laughs> no, no, not yet. I no, don't want to go oh, that quick. All right, then I'll then I'll backtrack and leave it to you to so, ask the question. <laughs> so, tell, so Tantamount existed in Spain for twenty years, um, more or less. Yes. Yeah. Would you you formed with your life partner? Yes. Whose name is? Are you allowed to share it? Uh, Fernando. Fernando. So you and Fernando created the company in Spain. And what was the essence then of Tantamount in the early days? What did you put together focus on in terms of serving your client? Right. Well, as I say, there was very much web because mm. we had the capability of, of providing web services and web was suddenly yeah. beginning to be very, very visible. Um, but essentially, the same as we do now, brand communication, so um, design, words, and brand messaging, whether it was print or, or web. Perfect. So, so in the early days, you would, as you'd explained earlier, you were at the start of the kind of web boom and, and how that all started to evolve, exciting time. Now, over to you then. So after 20 years, something else well, happened. Well, yes. Um, we, Spain is a wonderful place to live. Mm. And we were very relaxed about being in Spain. Yeah. And we'd been there a long time. Most people want to go there. Yes, quite. Yeah. The and it was sunny almost gorgeous. every day and we moved out to the country. Um, oh, my God. And we'd got a house which had every kind of fruit tree you can imagine oh, pretty much. And idyllic. It was idyllic. And then, of course, there was a recession. And Spain oh. was worse hit than most places, I think. But for us, the first couple of years of the recession were fantastic for our business because we were working with a few big companies mm. and they just threw money at the problem they said we can buy ourselves out of this right only that didn't work for them and as i say we'd got a few big companies that mm. we were working for and that is a big mistake that small businesses make sure. they say wow all this money from this company all this money from that company 
I don't have to work for anybody else. No. And then if those two clients stop, or even one of them, mm. you're in a really bad position. Yes. And that's the way we found ourselves then, that mm. the big companies stopped spending and the small companies had never really been spending very much mm. um, because you have a brand project or a website and then you go away for three years or five years until you need the next one it's not something that happens every day yeah unlike in a big company when you're communicating and need lots of different things and we'd also had then it was just at the time when digital books were becoming very popular and so there was this yeah migration of print workflows to digital and we were involved with that and it, yeah. as I say it was wonderful and then suddenly it stopped and I came back to the UK and we spent the next couple of years pretty much neither here nor there um, right. rather than being in two places and working well in both mm. we were too dispersed yeah and so really it's only been the last five years I suppose it is that we've been active properly focused and settled here in the uk okay great okay so this is home for now for now yes might you go back <laughs> that's a very interesting question because of course we came back here right into the mess that is Bre brexit mm. um and just as that was at least beginning to be clarified in one, some some senses mm. into this year which has been interesting to say the least <laughs> um but the whole brexit situation has changed freedom of movement freedom of where we can go and live yeah um from the name you'll realize that fernando is not english no. not british so um I'm rather well, hoping been that here five year, over five years. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, I would very much like to go back to Spain. What I would, what would be ideal for me is to mm. be able to live between the two countries, but do it more sensibly than we did when I first came over. Got you. One of the problems then was that it had been 30 years since I'd lived in the UK. So mm. I didn't have any contacts. I didn't have any, any network no. it was starting up from zero again wow that's despite tough. 20 years of experience in mm, spain mm. and are you still working with clients in spain some of them yes yeah. um i would i think our well our oldest client um we've been working with them since they started up and it's over 20 years that we've been working together we've we did their original branding their rebranding they took in new clients that look they took in new um not clients they they bought in other companies to be part of them right they shed some of those other companies so all this change and we've been with them all the way through but they of course also go through ups and downs and they're more active or less active yes um and yes we've still got clients in Spain. We've also got other international clients because in Spain, one of the sectors that we were working in was the hospitality and tourism sector. Mm. And through contacts, we've had, we've worked with clients in South America, mm -hmm. Switzerland, North America, essentially the, what for other people this year has been a, wow, we've got to work with people that we can't actually meet. <laughs> it's never been a problem for us. We don't yeah. care if we, we really like to meet our clients, but we don't need to. Yeah. We, we know we can work at a distance. So, so what you're saying, it really doesn't matter where you live in the world. It could be the UK, it could be Spain, it could be somewhere else. Your business exists globally internationally absolutely and um, actually although this year huh, hmm. we're, we're doing this interview in 2020 enough said we're not going to mention the c word <laughs> um basically 
with this year's to a degree to a small degree it's a tiny little gift for people who have already got experience of working remotely let's call it remotely and being able to service clients internationally remotely Absolutely. very well and for those who haven't actually it's been this transition's been made easier i know it's been dreadful for a lot of businesses and mm. to be honest ours hasn't been the best year ever mm. so it's not as if i'm saying we've done wonderfully out of this year but for some businesses the fact that there has been some government support for them they will have been able to explore avenues that they never could have done mm. i'm interested in this concept of you know how they say that the important thing when you have a business is to find your niche and most startup businesses go oh but i could do this for anybody mm. and we are always very reluctant to let go of all those other markets mm. and and you say but that niche it's so small but actually now it may be a small niche but we've got a global market yeah. and so if you can find a tiny niche and there's only one person in every city that mm. is your client mm. you've got millions certainly hundreds of thousands of clients potentially out there and if you can be that person tackling that niche mm. then you've got it made yeah and and there comes a point too that says well how many clients can you actually deal with at any one time you know absolutely um small businesses want loads of clients but unless you're selling something online that is electronic and gets shipped that way yeah. electronically or is physical and gets shipped which is a bit harder because that means you've got to carry stock but that is fine you can have millions of customers but if you are a service business where it's business to business you've only got so many hours in the day you want Absolutely. some you want some work life balance too you don't want to work all weekend therefore yeah if you're a startup you might want to in the beginning but in essence you you kind of say well i can cope with this many clients each month and yes, and you want great. single clients to spend more, which is why niching matters. Because if mm. you're just doing what everybody else does, then then you can't charge more than everybody else is charging. Mm. But if what you're doing is very, very specific, you yeah. can charge more for it because you're going to do it better than anybody else. Mm. And and so you don't need as many clients even if it's exactly the same thing, just offered to a different market, to a yeah. different client. Yeah. It makes a difference. Mm, absolutely. Okay. So really, really interesting discussion. I'd like to come back to tantamount if, if we can. Um, yep. So for now, you're in the UK. Let's forget about what might happen in the future, but I understand the whole Brexit thing. I mean, it's kind of affected me in a tiny way. I mean, I've been in this country for over 40 years and still have my Dutch passport. Yes. And I even had since 1978, I think it was, I've had a blue residence permit for the UK. Okay. So even though I've lived here over 40 years, I had a permanent residence permit. I still had to apply to get my, you know, permanent kind of yes. allowance yeah. to stay in the UK type of thing. And that, that was, yeah, that was interesting. I was like, why am I having to apply again? I've already got, here it is, you know, anyway. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, so you're here for now. Sorry, I went off on a tangent there. No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> You Tiny. obviously understand the, the problems involved. I do in totally this understand, yeah. Um, so Tantamance in the UK, and let's talk a little bit, let's unpick a little bit about the offer in the UK for, uh, you, you have mentioned it already in places, so people should get a rough idea of it, but 
repetition is the mother of skill. So let's let everybody hear it again. <laughs> um, in, in summary, then, tantamount can offer people brand and what else? Well, we're all about brand, which is expressing the personality of your business. Yes. We're also all about organization of information. Um, right. We, I think that this is earlier on I said about intermediary skills, that I was mm. working as an intermediary. Yes. And I think that that's one of the things that we do and what we offer our clients is mm. to take their message and express it in a way that will get through to the people they want to communicate it with. Yes. Because we all get, and this is absolutely typical, we all get too caught up in our own businesses to be able to explain them well. And even I have a problem explaining well what we do mm. because I'm so excited about all the things we can do. Yes. Because there is so much we can do. But essentially, it's the clarifying and organizing of the business message and then expressing it through design and through words mm. and using technology mm. and doing it in such a way that it will engage with the, the intended stakeholder because it's not going to be the same if you're doing that to a potential client mm. or if you're a charity and you're trying to talk to potential um, donors or you're trying to talk to your trustees or if you're a big corporate organisation and you're talking internally mm. and yet all of those are different spaces in which businesses need to communicate their values, their vision, their whole personality mm. and do it well and consistently. Yes. Yeah. Great. Was that, was that very vague or did you understand no, no, that? Cause no, I, I think you already know what we do. So. I do know. I mean, the way for me, it's, if I, if, if I had to sum up what Tantamount did in listening to you today, but having heard you speak about it previously, but also having looked at your website, I, I, I would put you, I have to put you in a bucket, right? <laughs> and I would say the bucket that I put you in is a creative agency, right? Absolutely. That's a nice pigeonhole, nice label. And we do love labels, we love labels. don't we? However, I... I do see a tiny bit more than the conventional creative agency, right? With that, good. Yeah, with that, and that's because I know you personally, and with that, and also you've explained it, I think the, the on top of the, the um, if, if you imagine the bucket and it's full with creativity and brand and personality, and websites and brochures and communication and video and animation and you name it everything's in the creative agency bucket but on top of that i would put a word in very big capital letters that says words right yes words so for me the added spice and correct me if I'm wrong, the added kind of, you know, the topping of mm. creative agency is the words. I think it feeds into all of the bucket, but it's the most important part, I be, believe, of, of a creative brand agency. One of the things is, of course, that you're talking to me mm. and I'm not a designer. And so what makes my heart beat is words um, and so you are getting all of this filtered through my view of things but yes. I think you're right I've always been a little bit loath to describe tantamount as a design agency mm. because design agencies I've seen too many that start off with design and mm. then it's only when they've gone a little bit down the road that they said oh, we're going to need some copywriting skills in here. Let's bring in so-and-so on this project. And for me, 
tantamount, the very name, is about balance and equivalence. And at the heart of tantamount is both design and words. Mm. It's language and image. And language and image is actually a, a, a slogan that I first started to use 30 something years ago. And it still is true. And it's become more and more true. Mm. Um, so yes, I think that the, the verbal skills feed in all, at all points on this journey. Mm. Even if when we look at a project, we say, we decide now not to include words. That's also a possibility, mm. but we do it knowing that we're doing it. It's a conscious decision. It's not a, oh, we haven't got anyone who can do any, so we'll, we'll, we'll skip them. Mm. It's actually that in the same way as I am interested in the design, Fernando is also interested in the words and he understands when it comes to design that if he's got this much space to fill, he needs the right words to fill that space. And he needs to break those lines in the right place. Mm. And that's where my poetry comes in, my line breaks in my poetry. And, mm. and I do think that it matters. And sometimes... 100%, yeah. Yeah. It, it matters more than people actually realise. And I think you're right, because my experience of creative design agencies, which is what you're not... Yes. <laughs> um, that's why I said a creative agency, mm. not creative design, is people come, oh, here's my portfolio of designs that we've done Absolutely. for clients. You know, this is what, I'd, what we can do from a design point of view. Well, actually, everybody thinks they're a good design, and now they go, oh, well, I can go onto Canva and create my own designs. You know, I know people that kind of go, oh, I've got publisher, I can create my own poster or whatever yep. um i've got adobe myself you know i've been doing it since i was at school but actually you know can they really because they might be able to put some sort of design together but if i haven't got the understanding of the language that needs to go with it then absolutely and of course your interest in storytelling and storytelling implies the the need for words obviously storytelling can be visual mm. and there's no reason why they should need to be words but yes we're used to talking about stories using language yeah. and using the right language because you can pick up a book and know whether it was written this century or two centuries ago there's mm. been a change in language you can tell yeah. often whether something's written by a woman or a man we we use different styles Right. Um, you can tell what sort of message something, what sort of level you're trying to talk to, what sort of audience you're communicating with, mm. depending on a choice of words. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah. of course, it's all reinforced by the visuals. Mm. But neither of them is complete without the other. No, and I always think of it as in kind of NLP. Uh, ways you know you've got to have you've got to it's the kind of visual um auditory and the kind of kinesthetic so you see something or you hear something or you read something you know so the seeing could be seeing the image and the words but you're also hearing those words in your head um, yes it's and true that a uh a, a visual can enter your brain far more quickly than words can. I remember yeah. on one occasion, um, I'm not a fan of horror films at all, mm. um, but I have seen far too many. Um, <laughs> yes. And I remember on one occasion having a nightmare, and I hate to say it, it was a nightmare about, who is it, Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street? I have right. never seen those films. And it was like, why on earth? That's mad. And then the next day I did the same journey on the Metro. This was in Madrid and I did the same journey. And I realized there'd been a poster. 
Oh. And that had just entered my brain. I hadn't seen it the first day because I wasn't paying attention. The second day, I was a lot more awake. Well, I'd had a bad night's sleep for a start. Mm. <laughs> but I actually realised that that got to me. And words won't do that. But if they engage at the right level and produce the right emotion, then they will be memorable. Do you, are you a fan of Darren Brown? Um, mm, yes and no. I, I don't know much about him, but I think I know what you're referring to. What yes, referring that, you can, to? that you can plant things and clue people in and subliminal influences. Yes, he very like much a, a so. A brand designer, creative agency, whatever, that he, want, they want, he wanted to make them, a, you know, do a poster. Mm. And um, they went in a taxi and on the journey, he had planted certain imagery. Yes. And he then created his poster in advance and based on the imagery that they would have seen. And they almost identically created. He also planted words in there as well on top of that. And he told them what the words needed to be and... Um, yeah no 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 there is there is certainly a skilled thing but it's not magic it no is. and and it, it isn't magic but that's why advertising unfortunately is still so profitable today because yes. it does work at some subliminal level we are all being brainwashed by adverts but don't get me started on that <laughs> So, That's a conversation for another day, I think, Michael. Yeah, yeah, I could, I could get very uh, irate, you know, passionate about it. <laughs> um, yes. Um, I prefer there, that choice of words, where you get irate or you get passionate. Mm. I mean, there's a whole different connotation and you may be describing exactly the same emotion. But yes, yes. by using one word and not the other, you've made it clear which side of the fence you're standing yeah yeah so um i know that you've launched something recently or looking to launch something recently so tell our listeners and viewers as well because this is going out on video as well um tell us what the latest kind of development <coughs> excuse me with tantamount right we've um well as i say tantamount was originally created in the golden age of multimedia so although this is a new, um, a, a, a new offering in some respects, mm. in some respects it's also going back to our roots. Uh, of course, yeah. Um, because we're looking very much now at the need for communication digitally. Mm. We can't be handing out fancy portfolios and fancy brochures. I can't pass a brochure to you through the screen. <laughs> so you have to go and look at it on a screen. And yes. so we're doing interactive, enhanced design. Right. And it's really exciting what you can do now. It's still using, it's using tried and true technology because mm. we've had websites for a long time. Mm. But lots of things with slideshows and video, what you were saying about engaging with different people who've got different learning processes you mm. mentioned a little bit about visual learners and mm. and getting in using the different senses yes well this is exactly what it is because um you can include video you can include slideshows you can have um connect with uh geolocation so that you can have customized content depending on where the user is Trying to think what else we can do in there there's just so much 360 degree views mm -hmm. so it's useful for education it's useful for selling products it's useful for um process simulation mm. you can have things like i don't know moving timelines all sorts of exciting things happening on screen mm. which it's not like the original websites that had sort of flashing buttons and ticker tape it's because it's what's needed now it's yes. not bells and whistles for the sake of bells and whistles no but so yeah enhanced design yeah it's probably the but best way of describing it's it 
creating a more interactive experience for people. Absolutely, because yeah. one of the problems with if you have a book and you're reading a book, then mm. you tend to sit back and you you're engaged physically with it. Mm. The the page won't turn without you, and you've got a whole different dynamic of engagement. Mm. But with things happening on screen, apart from the fact that you're normally waiting for a notification to ping or you're, you've got another screen going on there, mm. if you've just got this linear mm, connection of information, linear flow of information, mm. it's not that interesting. Mm. Um, you need to include people. You need them to in, be involved and make their decisions yes. You can set up a, a pathway where you expect them to go, mm. but maybe they want to take a different path. Mm. You can have hierarchical menus so that a, um, uh, someone only needs the, the introductory paragraph of each mm. section. Mm. They don't need to skip through the pages to get to the next introductory paragraph. They right. can jump from one section to the next yeah. in the order in which they find it useful. Mm. And then go back and dig deeper if that's what they're after. Mm. Great. Sounds exciting. And so um, where can people see this kind of in real life? Where do they go? Well, they can go to our website and the website is tantamount.com. And at the moment, certainly, they will find the first panel on that website is all about this. but also. If they click on the menu, interactive yeah. is the item on the menu across the top, and they'll get a whole page of information about it with a really nice um, example explaining all these different features. Brilliant. And I know that I shouldn't be focusing on features. I should be focusing on benefits, yes. which is that you're involving the client, 100%. that the client will be a lot more engaged. That's the main benefit. They'll be engaged well, and find the information they need quickly. Yeah. I think the important thing is that the longer a customer or a prospect, let's say, can be engaged with your collateral, <laughs> marketing collateral for want of a yes. better word, as long as they can, for as long as they can be engaged with your stuff <laughs> mm. uh, that you're trying to promote or educate or whatever um it means they're not looking elsewhere number one absolutely number two it will be more memorable once they leave and go away because if they've interacted with your let's call it interactivity design brochure whatever yes. online if they've interacted with it 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 stays longer in the brain, basically, you know. Absolutely, yes. And, and if they've had an emotional engagement with it, an emotional reaction mm -hmm. to it, whether it was excitement, whether it was interest, this, this is also what creates yeah. in memory. Yeah. And, and therefore, they'll remember you longer and they're likely to go back, potentially, or they may talk to other people about it, or they may decide to want to know more. And yes. that's really what the end goal is for anybody. You, they, people, clients, or let's call it the seller, wants a buyer to take action. <laughs> to either Absolutely. pick up the phone, send an email, or press the buy button. <laughs> it's one of the problems that... Um, People design websites thinking, we've got to put all this information, all the information you need has got to be on the website. It's actually, no. You want people to get interested enough to want to know more, yes. and the knowing more means that they will pick up the phone to you or send you an email, mm -hmm. and you've got to respond to that, and then you are started the conversation. Yeah. You don't just tell everything on the website. No, no. Brilliant. Okay. Oh. Really, really interesting. And so people can get that if they want that today. So they could speak to you 
and then learn more about that and get some examples and and um, absolutely yes get going um, right absolutely yes. recommended yeah <laughs> so um anything else about tantamount or what you're up to that we haven't discussed yet oh there's a whole other side that i have purposefully ignored oh, God, don't <laughs> ignore it why <laughs> which is um because of the words and images yes is um publishing and helping authors oh fantastic um, but that i really think is is something to put that's again partly because it's my personal passion there brilliant um but we talk you use the word collateral mm. and we use the word collateral and it's a lovely word but most people don't know that word no um uh, some people talk about corporate literature mm. and i like literature as a word because we talk mm. about corporate literature and we also deal with creative literature mm. so literature is a nice word for me um but yeah there are so many other words you can use there um i'm not sure that there's very much else i need to say brilliant mm. so mm. apart from tantamount.com where can they find tantamount on any other social media or yourself even right um tantamount.com is the website but almost all the social media i think is tantamount books okay. and that's why it was probably important to mention the, the publishing because otherwise it's like why books right. well we joined some of the social media a little bit late and at the time that we joined we were focusing on the publishing right. and now it's across the board tantamount books is our social media handle which will be twitter and instagram and we don't tend to do facebook um right. so yes i think it's basically twitter and instagram um and you've got a linkedin page and of course yes saying. there's a linkedin page and there's my profile on linkedin and all the stuff about me personally is out there under my name which is gwyneth box and because there are so very few people with that name essentially if you look for me online i've been online a long time and you'll find me <laughs> that's probably the best idea yes <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, it's been wonderful chatting with you, Gwyneth. It's been um, enormous fun. I didn't let you get a word in edgeways. No, but no, then... that's how it should be. That's exactly what podcasts are all about. You should do all the talking. And I did get a few words in, questions and things. But um, So I'm going to um, stop the recording for this so we can stop the video and we can stop the audio. But stay here for a minute don't disappear um and we can I'm still here say what happens next but for our listeners thank you very much for joining us today and we'll see you on the podcast next time bye for now thank you thank you for inviting me bye bye You're very welcome <laughs> bye for now staying alive uk share your story 